looks like we're live. Hi, let's answer your questions about dreams and disorders of dreaming. Have you ever experienced a sensation of being awake but unable to move or speak? Or what about the more immersive experience of being aware that you're dreaming and perhaps even having some control over those dreams? Today, we'll be discussing these questions and more by touching upon topics such as the interpretations and functions of dreams, about sleep paralysis, and about lucid dreaming. So welcome to our Ask an Expert live stream. My name is Monica, your host, and I am honored to be joined by Dr. Jalal today, who is our expert on dreams, sleep paralysis, and lucid dreaming. You have submitted your questions to our YouTube community page and our Discord server, and we've picked the top questions to answer today. So I invite you to deeply engage with our live stream by leaving your questions, your thoughts, or your comments in the chat box to the right, as we'll have an opportunity to answer these questions live at the end of the stream. So hope you stay tuned for that. In addition, you can leave your thoughts, comments, or questions in the comment section below, and I'll do my best, and the team will as well, to answer them after this stream. So we hope you stay till the end to learn some interesting facts about sleep paralysis, lucid dreaming, and about dreams in general. The plan is, during this time, I will be giving you a brief introduction to myself, a site to go team member, to our expert, Dr. And then we'll dive straight into the questions that you sent in. So let's begin. So as an introduction to myself, I'm Monica, and I'm a clinical neuroscience graduate student who is very interested in psychiatry and outreach initiatives. One of these outreach initiatives includes Psych2Go, where I'm very grateful to be able to interact with you, answer your questions, chat with you all, and of course, host these live stream with experts to make psychiatry accessible to all. As I know that many of you are joining us from all different parts of the world and at different times, I do want to remind you that this stream will be available for you to watch later, but we do encourage you to engage with us today. And now I will introduce you to our expert. Hello, Dr. Jalal. Thank you for joining us today. My pleasure, Monica. How are you? I'm very well, super excited for our discussions and to share our knowledge with everyone here. Yeah, same here, same here. Thought it might be a good opportunity to begin with a introduction so the community gets to know you a bit better. How does that sound? Sounds great. So we are very, very fortunate to have Dr. Balan Jalal, who is a researcher at Harvard University and a visiting researcher at Cambridge. He also completed his PhD there, and he has published 45 academic papers and is a co-author in a recent book by Cambridge University Press. The Telegraph described him as one of the world's leading expert on sleep paralysis. He was also ranked as the top rated expert in sleep paralysis in the world on expert scope base, expert scape, sorry, based on the scientific impact. His work has been featured in major media like New York Times, Washington Post, The Today Show, the BBC, The Guardian, and The Times. Furthermore, he has written about his research for the Scientific American, the Boston Globe, and the Big Think. He is truly an expert in this field, and we are so excited to have him join us today to share his expertise on this topic. So thank you so much for joining. Well, thank you so much, Inga Monica, and thank you so much for the generous introduction. Of course. So I thought let's begin with maybe just general questions that the community has submitted regarding dreams in general. Yeah. Yep. Um, yeah. So one of the top questions were actually sent by Justin via YouTube. 
his mm-hmm. general idea is that many people or many psychologists and neuroscientists um, tend to think that dreams either have meaning or they don't. It's kind of usually split, right? So which leads to his question of what do you think the functions of dreams are? Or do you want to give an overview? overview about some of the different theories and discuss those maybe? Oh yeah, absolutely. Well, dreams is a heavy topic, right? So we're diving right in. Uh, so what's going on going on during dreams, right? You find yourself transported into this bizarre and strange world where you're basically, you're, you know, you are encountering these novel environments. They're usually very strange. And oddly, you don't know, you don't feel like it's novel. Even though it's novel environments, you don't feel like it's necessarily novel. And you don't feel like it's bizarre and strange, even though the fabric of reality is all warped, right? So time, places, people, everything is sort of shifted. So what's going on? And, and can, the, can your brain sort of explain this bizarre world? Can, 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 can the brain and neuroscience explain the fact that people all around the world, when I go lecture in whatever country, people will tell me I was chased by this monster and I couldn't get away. My, my legs were, they felt so heavy, you know? Did you, do you have that a dream once in a while, Monica? Like you're trying to yeah. move, on your, but your legs are so heavy, you can't really get away and the monster is chasing you or whatever it is. Things are very strange. And also dreams tend to be uh, heavily populated by people. So there's something about the way that we construct a theory of m- other minds that's v- sort of heavily involved during dreams. So, so what's going on? So let's look at the brain, right? So what's happening during dreams? But in order for us to understand dreams, we have to understand that these vivid, lifelike, crisp dreams that we all have and we re- uh, remember for the most of uh, the time emerge out of something called REM sleep. So each night we go through different phases of, uh, of sleep. Uh, so we have stages one and two where our heart rate and blood pressure drops, right? And then we go into sort of what's called deep sleep where we have a lot of shopkeeping going on. So things like uh, repair of like, um, you know, muscles and DNA repair and things like that. So it's really like, really like a shopkeeping time, right? And then from there we into into what's called REM, the REM phase. And here we have the lifelike and crisp dreams where we are paralyzed. Okay, and we are paralyzed during these dreams in order to avoid, uh, you know, uh, to avoid hurting ourselves during these dreams. Okay, so during this REM phase, uh, the neurochemistry, the neurochemical environment is different than life, uh, waking life, basically. Okay, so you have chemicals like serotonin. So this chemical involved in mood, the neurons that produce serotonin are stop act are not inactive during a REM sleep. Okay, so they replenish, they need to sort of be recharged, like you recharge your iPhone, for example, or your smartphone, right? So they are re- recharged. And, and so that means, you know, the cortex, the, the, the top layer of the brain, which is important for a lot of uh, different things like logic and agency and awareness of the self and things like that. Since that chemical is not available during uh, REM sleep and during dreams, and that means our logic centers in the brain uh, don't work as they should. They're not optimally functioning. And that explains why dreams are strange and bizarre to get to the, uh, qu- you know, the question, right? Why dreams, do they have a meaning? Well, they are strange and bizarre because a part of the brain known, known as the dorsal lateral prefrontal cortex, a fancy name for structure, important in the sense of logic, logic and putting the world together in a coherent way. Well, that part of the brain is not working. So dreams are strange. So that's an explanation for that. Or why do you have these dreams where you can't move, for example, and the monster is chasing you? Well, it turns out because you need that cortex to be working right during dreams and the serotonin, that chemical is not there to give gasoline to the CEO or that part of the brain that's important for, for those functions. Well, the emotional part of the brain gets the upper hand in a way because the, cor- the cortex is Im- important for inhibiting your emotions, and so the emotions represents that monster chasing you. And since you can't really dampen those emotions, well, that means you're heavy, you know. And the motor cortex is also in the in that region, and so that explains why you are weak in sort of movement. Does that make sense, or was that a sort of a long-winded answer to explain to basically say that you know the the, the brain and the neurochemistry, the neurochemical environment of the brain, explain very explains well why uh, dreams have that you know uh, reality to them that we experience each night basically that's such a fascinating response 
I never really thought of it um, mm -hmm. really being centered around the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex and having that kind of being dampened down a bit as a reason why we have such bizarre dreams. So that was really, really cool to hear, which well, is actually very interesting um, because I wonder, do you know if there's any differences between people who have healthy brains and those who might have lesions to that area? And to Are that there differences area, in their dreams? Oh, that's a great question. Would there be differences? Well, we've hypothesized so that we think that, um, yes, probably there would be some, some, some changes, but I'm not even aware of, of what the literature would say. So obviously, if you are blind, your visual cortex is out of, is not, you don't have a visual cortex or you're sort of congenitally blind, right? Then you won't have visual dreams, right? That, that's so you will have auditory dreams, you will have, you will have tactile sensations, but you won't actually see things. But yeah, I would, I would venture that if there's something wrong in those structures of the brain, you know, things would be different. Let me give you an example. So um, one thing about dream is the sense of self, right? The sense of I, the sense of Beland or Monica, right? I feel like I feel anchored in this body, right? I, I don't feel like I'm floating out in space. And there, there are structures in the brain called this um, superior parietal lobule or the TPJ, basically structures in the parietal lobes that creates a sense of self, okay? And it turns out when you are in REM sleep, the TPJ, for example, that region deactivates. It doesn't work as it should. And that, that explains why your sense of self is loosened up during dreams. That explains why you can take the vantage point of Monica during your dreams, right? Like a first person's perspective, I see myself, or you can feel like you're actually seeing yourself from outside perspective. So it's almost like you're a spectator of your dreams. Or I've had a dream where, I've, where I was catapulted into somebody else's you know, body and I was seeing the world through their point of view. And the, and the explanation is then that the sense of self is not, uh, or that that structure of the brain is not working as it should. Now, I would, my guess would be that if you have lesions to that parts of the brain, there is that, you know, the, those, those part, portions of the brain aren't working as they should. Well, then likely you might have uh, dreams where the sense of self is distorted, you know, and because they actually, they, their sense of self is distorted during waking life. So people with strokes in that part of the brain will attribute their limbs, for example, to other people. Uh, and things like that. So yeah, I guess so. But uh, definitely, uh, it's it's a great question, tricky question. Yeah, it's super cool. And just knowing that, for example, if we're going to talk about memory and dreams. Memory yeah. is not only you know a part like the hippocampus is not just the the center for memory. Like people, I think, have known that it's more integrative. Like the neocortex is involved, for example. Yeah. Um, which leads me to one of the questions that. Kyoto from YouTube has asked, which is, are there any correlates to the frequency in what makes people remember their dreams more? Can it be explained by having one part of the brain more activated or anything like that? Yeah, it's a great question. So it turns out 95% of dreams are not remembered. So people forget their dreams all the time. And the reason is the, uh, you need really, really need serotonin. You need, uh, you know, these structures to be, uh, you know, these, these chemicals to be available when you sleep so you can transfer short-term memories to long-term memories, right? Um, so given that that, that that chemical is not available, so serotonin is important for that, for that process, you will forget your dreams. But in fact, when you wake up, when wakefulness occurs, uh, there's a surge of serotonin to your, so your, your brain is flooded, your cortex is flooded with serotonin and noradrenaline. And that explains why you can remember your dreams exactly in that time window of like a minute or 30 seconds. Uh, that's because your brain is flooded with serotonin. And so it's a good time to do it having a, a dream journal. Now, in terms of remembering your dreams, uh, there is a correlate. So people that are, um, to my People that have more, uh, was it, sorry, it escapes me now because, you know, I think it was, if you can't remember your dreams, it was either heavy sleepers or people that have a fragmented sleep. It, it escapes me right now, but there's certainly a co correlate of how people that remember. I think it was, yeah, it, I have to, I have to think about it. I can't remember. Maybe, maybe it comes back. Memory, you see, it's about remembering dreams. <laughs> yeah. now, there is certainly a co correlate of, of, of that. Uh, but but yeah, 95 or so percent of dreams are, are not remembered. It has to do with this transfer of memory from short to long and to do with, with uh, that being, uh, you know, that part of the brain not working as it should during, during REM sleep. Thank you. That's very, very interesting. I'd love just to know how, you know, neuroscience connects with 
our conscious perceptions, dreams, yeah. all that. It's very interesting. Another mm. question that was submitted along these lines of remembering our dreams yeah. was from Free, who has asked, why do you think that some people experience reoccurring dreams? Ah, reoccurring dreams is a good question. So I think there, there are different explanations for it. Um, probably one thing could be in people with trauma and PTSD, right? So because the dreams are so salient and in this, like the circuits mediating those dreams, right? Let's say there's a negative association of a night, you know, so it becomes a nightmare and it reoccurs. Uh, perhaps because your emotional brain, the, the limbic system is overactive and then and that dreams keep reoccurring. Uh, but in terms of people that just have, have the same positive dream all the, uh, over, uh, like all the time, it's a good question. I, I think it probably has to do with how often they think about it during waking life, if it has a salient, important meaning for them, and then they think about it and it just keep reoccurring. Uh, so I think so it has to do with salience, this term meaning that it's important, it has some emotional value for you, and then, and then it, it just keeps reoccurring. That would be my my uh, thought on that. That makes a lot of sense. Actually, I was writing my applications for uni, mm -hmm. and as a part of it, I had to write a personal statement. And this is an important piece of writing, so people kind of understand why I want to do what I want to do. Yeah. And I kept thinking about it. So actually two nights ago, I don't know what happened. I literally wrote the first paragraph in my dreams and then I woke up and wrote this down and it was, it's literally in my applications right now. So I think that makes a lot of sense just to, you know, <laughs> explain it by having that emotional salience aspect. It's definitely very true for me. And yeah. And, and that too, but also I was just interesting about the whole idea of like, like having insights in your dreams. So it turns out uh, because, so we, we mentioned that this chemical in serotonin is not available, right? So uh, during REM, during REM sleep, and that explains mm -hmm. the, the logic and all that not working right. But also, so noradrenaline, also the neurons that produce this chemical is, is also on sort of uh, taking a nap. Uh, forgive the, 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 the metaphor. Yeah. But they're taking a nap. And, and so for that reason, because, you know, adrenaline and noradrenaline, right, you need adrenal, adrenaline to really focus in and be sort of really narrow and focused. And because noradrenaline is not available during REM sleep, well, that explains why you can think in a more sort of broad way, that concepts can float around more and you are less focused than on things. Well, in a sense, that allows you to be more creative, right? Because then, again, because logic is out of the picture and because you've, you have this more broad perspective, you can think of things in novel new ways and give have fresh insights. And there's lots of examples of like, you know, the great math mathematician at uh, Trinity College, uh, Ramanujan? The, the Indian yes, I know. Yes. You know, right? So yeah. So, so, yeah, Monica and I, you're at Oxford and I used to, uh, I, I did my PhD at Cambridge. So we have, yeah. this, you know, so well, this guy, he was, he was, uh, he was having insights in his dreams uh, and sort of mathematical insights that uh, were, were great for his time, you know, and stuff like that. And, and we had Edison too. So Edison, I believe it was Edison, I'm pretty sure. So what he would do is that he would sleep, like he would sit on a table like this or, or a chair like this, excuse me. And you have like a spoon in his hand and, 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 uh, and a plate on the floor and he would keep the spoon like this, right? So like this, the camera is here. Yeah. <laughs> he, would have this, he would have the spoon in his hand and there was a plate on the floor and he would sort of drift off to sleep. And, and then by the time he would fall asleep, you know, the, the spoon would go on the, uh, on the plate and, you know, and then he would wake up and write down his dreams. And this was a way to get insight to uh, the, the dream information so he could have new discoveries. So yeah, dreams are an interesting world. And I've certainly been able to actually get some of my own ideas, scientific ideas from dreams, you know, so yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a very interesting world. You've probably heard of Kekule, um, the scientist who apparently um, dreamt about the structure of benzene. So the yeah. story was people didn't really know what benzene would have looked like, yeah. um, but he had this dream where a snake was chasing his own tail and yeah. it created that you know cyclic structure of benzene, yeah. which was true to an extent. There were some details that were lacking, but the basis yeah. of it was essentially or so-called informed 
by dream. So it's lovely to see this interaction between creativity and applications to science or real life. Yeah, exactly. And especially because dreams is supposed to be this like weird, fluffy world that lacks sort of, you know, the laws of, of, of reality don't, don't cohere to our sort of, you know, scientists would like to be precise and all that. And here you are in this sort of world where everything is bizarre and strange. And yet you can have, you know, striking scientific insights that can that can guide your science and shows you how how, you know, how amazing that is. But yeah, for sure. We actually have a question that was just sent in and it's quite relevant to our discussion now. So I thought maybe we can chat about that. And if there are any more live questions from our members, just do put it in the chat. We'll get to it. Um, Charmaine has asked, um, contrary to how dreams can be used to inform scientific findings, how true is just general dream interpretations? Is there a meaning behind things like teeth falling off or like people chasing you things like that things like that it's a great question is there is there a meaning to that so um there's the brain right there is the brain as we mentioned somebody chasing you well that can explain mm -hmm. by the brain and your emotional centers being overactive right and i, and I want to really make sure this point is clear right so the frontal cortex is like the the, the, the super ego of freud or the sort of ceo and it sort of dampens your emotions that's so when you go out and face a bear or whatever situation, right, your emotions will flare up and then you will have your cortex telling you, telling the emotional part, well, relax or whatever the case might be, right? It will sort of have that. And but during dreams, the, the cortex is simply, simply so weak that the emotion will get the better of you, right? So, so that, and, and so this shift in neurochemistry can explain a lot of things. So the question is, is there a, then additional meaning to all of that? And, and, and I think... Well, potentially, um, there might be other meanings to it, like psychological or whatever. Uh, but 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 you can also definitely there's a descriptive meaning, I think, in terms of the brain. Um, so somebody then that, that I knew briefly at Harvard, uh, Alan, Alan Hobson, he, he uh, I knew him. I, I interacted with him a few times. He, you know, he was a very caring uh, guy. He was very warm, very warm person, a great dream researcher, and unfortunately passed away recently. Um, so he has a lot of ideas about how, you know, how you have all this neural firing during, you know, REM sleep, or you have vivid dreams. In fact, if you look at the brain of somebody in REM sleep, right, you know, and you, you eavesdrop on the activity of neurons, the guy in REM sleep looks just like the person who's awake, right? So there's mm -hmm. the in fact, if you look deep enough, the guy in REM, he looks more awake than the guy who's actually awake in some cases. There's a burst of, of activity of neurons. So the question is, is the brain just trying to make sense of all these neurons by creating coherent stories? Like the brain is a storyteller. We know that, you know, so we survive by telling stories. So if you have uh, things in the environment, your brain will create stories and narratives around that. So the brain is a great storyteller. So is the brain simply making sense of all this neural activity and saying, look, let me you know, create a coherent story around that, or is there a deeper meaning? I think there's, that's up to, to question and it depends on the perspective you're coming from. So if you're somebody who's looking at it from a spiritual perspective, you might have one view. If you're coming from the brain perspective, you have one view, but definitely the descriptive brain perspective makes a lot of sense from from that you know point of view so so yeah that's uh was there anything else embedded in that question so there was a question of uh if the dream dreams have meaning right is was that yeah, just different interpretation yeah that was charmaine's question um, yeah. hope you enjoyed the answer charmaine if you have any follow-ups well um do let us know we did ex touch on the topics of like themes that come up in dreams so i'll put timestamps on those parts later on for them to check out. And I just like to say for people who are just joining us that we're currently talking about the questions that you submitted on our YouTube and our Discord regarding dreams in general, but we'll soon get into sleep paralysis and lucid dreaming. So please continue watching and then we'll get to answer your questions live. All very exciting stuff to come. Um, so another question that was submitted by Alexander, I think it's one of our last questions in their dream section, is that can dreams be so mundane that they're often confused for real memories? It's quite specific, but it's very interesting. And yeah, it's a good question. Can dreams be so mundane that they would be um, uh, sort of confused for memories? 
Well, the thing is in people with narcolepsy, so this, these are a, a, a patient population where the people, they might fall asleep. Uh, so I usually give a lecture and I say, if, I, if you fall asleep during the lecture, then that makes sense. I'm just being boring. But if I fall asleep as the lecture, then I might have narcolepsy, right? So it's this, these are people who've just fall asleep all of a sudden. Now it turns out people with narcolepsy, uh, ironically, uh, or strangely uh, rather, tend to, uh, these people tend to sometimes uh, mistake a dream, uh, the dream world with, with uh, the, uh, the wakeful world. So there can be some confusion or things leaking over. But typically, um, can people forget? I think they're, yeah, they probably could, um, uh, they might, but it's not, it's not really that common. I, I think, um, yeah, I don't think it's common. So there's actually debate about what deja vu, right? Whether when you go see something, like you go and you see, uh, you go to Egypt for the first time, right? First time and you see the pyramid or something, or that's a bad question. That's because you've seen that in movies or in, on TV. Yeah. When you go see someplace new, right? And you say, oh my God, I've been here before. What's going on? And the question, and then, so some people explain that away by saying, look, you had a dream where you saw some similar landscape in your dream. You forgot about it and you're seeing that now. And then that's deja vu. So uh, it's, it's a good question. I'm not sure if it's 100% known, but, but, I'm, I'm, but I'm sure it could be possible. Yeah, I've heard some, I think it was a concept called like false awakening, where you essentially just dream about going about your day. And I've had that happen to me once. I would dream that I just get up, brush my teeth, like eat, and then only to wake up and realize that it was a dream. And that's exactly what I'm going to do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that, that's, that's, that's interesting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, that's uh, really that's cool. Well, there's a lot of these things. Or well, when you do a certain task uh, a lot, like, um, you know, if you do something over and over during a particular day, then you like driving, like I've had where I was driving like three or four hours, then I go to bed and I dream about myself driving and things like that, where, yeah, so that's another example of, of uh, yeah, of, of something that, uh, but, but yeah. Yeah, let's um, transfer into more interesting experiences of sleep. So things like sleep paralysis and lucid dreaming now. Um, but before we do, I just want to give a, a thank you to Nancy G for being our new member. Um, it's our members that allow us to make these streams possible. So thank you very much. And yeah, so for sleep paralysis, we definitely have a lot of questions for these. Um, I think it might be a good plan to just give our viewers an idea of what sleep paralysis is for those who don't know or who the, for those who are just curious to learn more. Yeah, yeah. So sleep paralysis is a very interesting phenomenon. It affects about 20% of the population who have had at least one of these episodes. So it sort of entails you being paralyzed uh, during, during uh, at, you know, waking up from sleep or falling asleep, which is the technical definition. But like typically you would be sleeping and then you realize, my God, I'm actually awake. I can see my surroundings, but uh, I can't move. I can't speak. So I'm paralyzed. Uh, and then you might feel like there's a shadow or, or, or being from the corner of the room approaching you, uh, pressing on your chest. Um, and yeah, you might see shadow-like creatures. Um, and, and so it has this basic, uh, you know, ex experience to it, what we, call, what we call phenomenology of like you being paralyzed upon a falling asleep or awakening. And then, yeah, being unable to move or speak. Uh, yeah, so it's quite, quite interesting uh, and, and spooky experience. Are there any triggers that can give rise to someone being more likely to have sleep paralysis? Yeah, so there, there, are, there are triggers. Um, so sleep paralysis, so let me just, yes, if you have the sort of fragmented uh, sleep, so if your sleep is fragmented, if you have anxiety, people that drink alcohol and things like that, uh, college students who are stressed uh, tend to have higher rates. There's a genetic component that would push you into waking up during during uh, REM. So this phenomenon, uh, just to be clear, it is it occurs out of REM sleep, right? So as we mentioned, during uh, REM sleep, you are paralyzed from head to toe, right? So you can't move, you cannot speak. Now, um, and, and, and that paralysis occurs because structures in the lower part of your brain are paralyzing you, uh, as, as we mentioned, preventing you from acting out your dreams and hurting yourself. Now, occasionally, for some reason, that's actually not completely known, uh, your perceptual part of the brain can start becoming active uh, and you start being perceptually awake 
even though you're physically in REM sleep in the sense that you are paralyzed. And so if you have this collision between sort of the waking world perception colliding with the REM physiology. So you have these two worlds colliding. And then on top of that, you can then have what we would call REM mentation or dream, the dream world projecting into your wakeful world. So the world of dreams uh, can, you you technically uh, dreaming with your eyes open in that situation, which is quite, uh, you know, peculiar. So that's what it is. But yes, definitely these triggers, these things I mentioned could, could lead you to have more sleep paralysis. And, and we've done research uh, around the world uh, on this. I think in like five or six countries now. And uh, it's a really deep phenomenon. People around the world explain sleep paralysis in different ways. So in Italy, people will talk about, uh, in some parts of Italy, people will talk about a pandafica, which is like a witch or a giant cat that comes at night, attacks you. In Egypt, it's something called the jinn or the evil genies of like Aladdin, if you've seen that cartoon. Yeah. That. Yeah, so that's that's the Egyptian version. And in Denmark, people just say it's stress, physiology, anxiety, things like that. That's how people in Denmark tends to explain it. Uh, and then, yeah, in the U.S. and in some populations, people will talk about space alien abduction. You're lying, you're paralyzed, unable to move or speak. So that's a subgroup in, in the U.S. will talk about that. So there are these explanations. But interestingly, what our research shows is that if you have fearful, terrifying, uh, you know, uh, explanations for sleep paralysis, well, that can affect your, you know, the experience itself. It can have like, you know, like the placebo effect. Uh, you know, I tell you, drink some water, Monica, and this water is just like super juice. You drink it and you become like super strong. Well, this is the opposite. You know, it's called the nocebo or the nocebo effect. I tell you, you'll die from taking this pill, which is just, uh, you know, salt or whatever. It's not really anything. Then you're, you react to it. So similarly, we think that uh, because of these fear, these explanations, these ex very exotic, uh, elaborate explanation for sleep paralysis, uh, a lot of, you know, it can lead to the experience becoming much more uh, profound in, in ways. And I'm happy to go into detail. Do you want me to go explain what our research shows? Or Yeah, I think that'd be wonderful. I think people okay. would be very happy to hear it. All right, very cool. So basically, it's something like this. So we found that in, I want I really wanted to look at Egypt because it's a place with a lot of you know uh, spiritual traditions going back to the pharaohs and all that you know ma magic and mystery. And Denmark is typically more of a sort of a secular place. Uh, people are very rational. I grew up in Denmark. I love Denmark and I love Egypt. I've spent time there too. Okay, so uh, it turns out in Egypt, people have excessive fear of sleep paralysis because of some of the cultural uh, explanations. So they will, you know, 50% of people will say that they can die from sleep paralysis. So it's much more terrifying and, 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 and fearful in that way. But it also turns out that people in, in Egypt will have sleep paralysis uh, three times more frequently. So the people who have sleep paralysis have it three times more often than people from Denmark. And also their perceived length of the paralysis, meaning how long they think they're paralyzed, is significantly longer than the Danish people. So it turns out, it seems from their understanding, their minds have changed the experience into something much more fearful, frequent, and salient, emotionally you know, powerful. And what we think might be going on is something I usually explain by the little Lisa example. So let me tell you what I mean. This little Lisa example is, is the following. So if you live in a culture, okay, let's say uh, this is far, far away, uh, fictitious island. There's this little girl, okay, she's called little Lisa. And she's sitting by the uh, dining table and having dinner with her grandmother. And the grandmother says, look, little Lisa, there's this monster coming at night, okay? It looks like this and this and this, okay? It has long bangs. It's like, you know, it has, you know, it looks, you know, specific features, you know, it looks like this and that. It will come, it will choke you, strangle you, do all these things to you, right? Now, little Lisa is terrified. She's scared now. She goes to, and mind you, she has never experienced sleep paralysis in her entire life. She goes to bed now and she experiences sleep paralysis for the first time, okay? What's going on, all right? So it turns out, by you sleeping and having anxiety and what we call nocturnal arousal, meaning the emotional part of your brain is overactive, then it's, it itself can push you into having sleep paralysis and wake up during REM sleep. Okay, so that there's a, there's a correlation, there's a link between you having brain activity in the emotional part and waking up during REM and having sleep paralysis. That's the first thing. Second, second when you are expecting sleep paralysis to occur, 
you are in a way primed to having it. So this is a form of conformatory surveillance, surveying of your body and bodily sensations. So you're lying there. Lisa is lying there and surveying. If anything is holding her down, anything is pressing on her chest or pressing on her body. And so she will try to, and when she then suddenly feels something, you know, in her body as being stiff, she will wake up. And when she then wakes up, she's paralyzed during REM. She will try to move. And when she tries to move, um, she might see whatever her culture, culture dictates in terms of what the hallucinations might look like. So she will see that ghost or that monster or whatever that her, her grandmother was talking about. And she wakes up the next day. She's terrified. She will, get, she will go tell other people, you know, friends in school, oh, I saw this monster. It looks like this, this and that. And they will also start perhaps hallucinating, you know, having the same type of sleep paralysis occur. And little Lisa will be more terrified for the next night and the third night and the fourth night. So she will have it even more. And then by a month later, she might even be predisposed to anxiety and chronic, you know, perhaps maybe even PTSD from these kinds of experiences. Uh, and that's what our research suggests that in, in these cultures, uh, in Italy, for example, we found that sleep paralysis, having this experience was associated with things like, you know, trauma, things like, um, you know, anxiety in, in Italy as well. We found a similar pattern in Italy where people have cultural explanations. Does this make sense? Or am I just rambling here? What do you think? No, I think it's very fascinating. And it really goes to show that neuroscience is truly not an isolated discipline. It borrows a lot from even philosophy, I think, and psychology, and it blends it all together and gives each person a unique experience because yeah. ultimately everyone's different. Everyone has gone through different things. And for Lisa, it might, it might be this. And who knows, maybe for like Bob, they might have a different experience. So yeah. Yeah. it's very interesting to see in different contexts how people interpret the same situation. Absolutely. No, no, it's very true, you know, how these things work. And, and, uh, and it's certainly um, interesting to see how your, your, your culture can dictate, dictates these things. But at the same time, I want to add here that there also seems to be a strong uh, neurological component in terms of explaining why people have certain hallucinations, right? So we've ha I have theories for why people see shadow like beings, why, you know, people have out of body experiences, and it has to do with those structures in the brain that you know are creating a sense of I, a sense of self, right? Mm -hmm. And so during sleep paralysis, you are paralyzed, unable to move or speak. Uh, and so your first reaction there is to try to move, try to sort of get out of there. So your brain will send all these signals for you to move, but there's no feedback coming back to your body, helping you to create a sense of self in those parts of the brain. Uh, and so this distinct sort of this, the synchrony or this sort of uh, mismatching of, of neural signals, your you know, signals going out, uh, move, but no proprioceptive feedback, meaning feedback from your limbs, from your joints, from your muscle, telling your brain how to create a sense of self. I hope this part, uh, portion is not too complicated. It's very simple in the sense that uh, your sense of self gets distorted. And it explains why people not only will have like sea shadow like beings, but they will also often, I've had those hallucinations during sleep paralysis, or visions or whatever, where you see your legs flying up in the air, or you see yourself slightly, you know, flying outside yourself, or you, I've had like, a copy of myself hovering over me and having a chat with him, an out-of-body experience. And so all of this is a part of, of, of the sleep paralysis experience, the self being heavily distorted. Um, so, yeah. Yeah, let's talk further about this whole experience of dreams. Perhaps we can shift into questions that we have about lucid dreaming. Um, so before we do so, we have a new um, member, Gypsy. Thank you so much for being a member on the Psych2Go YouTube channel. Um, Gypsy has actually asked a question before we shift. Um, do you believe it's possible when we sleep and our consciousness um, could cause us to get sucked into someone else's body? I think that's very interesting. <laughs> Is it a perception? So, so the, yeah. So I, I want to, can you, can you say that again, Monica? Yeah, I think their question is probably asking more about how real it is that there's the perception in sleep paralysis that you can get like sucked into someone else's body. I'm not quite sure exactly, but um, if you have any thoughts on that, you can comment. Otherwise, we can um, see if Gypsy you have any other um, kind of way to rephrase it. So I'm, I'm, fi I'm fine with either. What are your thoughts? Yeah, so... 
I think that um, the thing is with that, it's, it's a great question um, in a sense, right? So the sense of self is sort of, is, is, is flo- it's, it's, you feel like you're floating outside your body and, and things like that. So it, it, it gets to the question of whether this, how the self is constructed, right? So as a neuroscientist, we would say that, well, because your self, sense of self is loosened up, uh, then, then uh, of course, we wouldn't say that you can be sucked into somebody else's body per se, because there's no mechanism in, in neuroscience yeah, exactly. that the brain, but 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 certainly from from a perception point of view, you know, you might feel like you are, uh, you know, going into somebody else's body. That could, I hope that explains. yeah, I hope that answered your question, Gypsy. If you have any more specific things or any follow up, then please let us know in the. Um, comment section. I'm monitoring it. So for any of you who just joined, you can still ask questions there. We'll be very happy to tackle them in our last 15 minutes or so. And yeah, so Gypsy just sent a follow-up saying that she experienced being sucked into someone's body and started to experience what was happening to her. That is like very scary, isn't it? It's very scary. Yeah. So, so I think it's the, it's the idea of the subjective self, right. And what's going on. And, and what I want to add here is that during sleep paralysis, and this is during my own sleep paralysis experiences too. So uh, you and I, Monica had a chat about this a long time ago where my, my actually my first sleep paralysis episode that I had as, as coming out of high school, I had this very vivid uh, experience of like, I feel like it was a ghost in my room trying to choke me and all that. And it was so real, right. It was, as real as this conversation, I felt like you and I are having. So the question was, how do you, how do you know that is not the real world versus this other world, right? Yeah. So always this idea of subjective reality and then physical, you know, scientific, the world that we're living in that we can observe and measure. Now, the question is during these subjective experiences, we will try to explain that in terms of science, but there's still a strong subjective component to it. Like, and what does that mean in itself? Now we can we can try to explain that in scientific terms, but people have their own subjective experiences of the world that is that is hard to argue with at the same time. Even though you give it this descriptive meaning, like I mentioned before, I say that you know your dreams mean this and that, but it's not negating that it could not have a spiritual meaning of sorts. Mm-hmm. But it's not negating that it could still have a deeper meaning as well, you know. But, uh, but the point is, there is this, this subjective and there's the third person scientific view. And as a scientist, I, I just stick to the scientific point of view. And, uh, but, but, but yes, uh, you know, it's not to negate the personal subjective experience of, of things feeling very real, of course. Mm-hmm. So let's talk about the science of lucid dreaming. Yeah. It's a very yeah. interesting thing. Sometimes yeah. my sister would tell me how she knows that she's dreaming and that she can have control of what she wants to do. But for me, I've never experienced lucid dreaming. I think it'd be super interesting to be able to do so. So I was thinking maybe we can start off with telling the audience what lucid dreams are and are there any ways to kind of induce this very realistic sense or sensation of dreaming? It's, yeah, a great question. Lucid dreams are intriguing, right? I mean, here you find yourself then in, in these strange worlds, these bizarre landscapes, but yet you are aware that it's a dream. Like, you know, oh my God, I'm dreaming. So I can therefore, uh, you know, manipulate the, the, this world. I can, I can meet people I want to meet. I can engage in dreams and fantasies that I've had, right? People fly, people meet people that they want to meet and do all kinds of things. So it's, it's really a magical and wondrous world. And I've certainly found myself in those dreams. As I remember as a kid, when I first had sort of dreams like that, I, it started with me saying to myself, I want to fly in my dream. I want to fly, I want to fly, I want to fly. This was how I started as a kid, you know, I want to fly. And so I slept and then just one day I magically realized, my God, I can actually, I know that I'm dreaming and I can fly now. And like Peter Pan, I was just flying all around sort of the landscape and mm-hmm. looking down. And it was, it was, it was amazing, right? It felt so good. And, and so since then I've had uh, lucid dreams once in a while and it turns, it turns out, I, uh, dreaming, dreaming that you can fly is one of the most common themes in lucid world of lucid dreams. So what are lucid dreams? What are they about? Well, it turns out it's our, the cortex part of the brain, the frontal, the logical part of the brain. Remember I mentioned that your sense of awareness and logic goes away. The, the, we mentioned the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex and whatnot, right? So those stru- structures are important for agency, knowing, uh, being aware of yourself. And they go away during 
the REM dreams, right? They, so that's why you don't know that you're dreaming when you're dreaming. But occasionally, for some reason, uh, they can be activated prematurely, and then you find yourself in this dream where you know you can influence things. And 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 can you induce these? Well, it turns out by telling yourself, you know, I want to know that it's a dream, right? That's a way to do it, right? Or tell yourself, if I meet, you know, or you can use light cues. So people have go like goggles they will use, and then seeing certain. Uh, light flashing before their eyes, and that can help them, uh, you know, wake up. So there's actually a commercial product. You know, you the USA they do everything. You know, they, they all have for everything. So there's like there's a there's a product where you see light, and then that will help you remember. Oh, when I see like three flashes of light, that means I'm in a dream. So remember now, something like that. Uh, so those are all things, and typically people will, if they see like William Shakespeare or something like that, or death, a uh, dead relative, that can help them remember it's a, it's only a dream, and then they become lucid. But yeah, lucid dreams are are fascinating, you know, fascinating world. Yeah, definitely. Um, on the topic of lucid dreams or interesting experiences during dreams, we have a new member, Eleanor. Thank you for being a member. Um, she has mentioned about the experience of having dreams within dreams which essentially is this um she mentions that she will dream that she falls asleep and then dream inside her dream <laughs> is there a kind of interesting interpretation of this or um within neuro, dreams. yeah neuroscience thing <laughs> well as a nurse yeah it's, it's, it's a great question how this works well let me let me tell you uh, dreams within dreams is it's a very curious phenomenon and i've had that i've had dreams and then a dream within that dream. So I was in a in and then so I was in a dream, and then I had another dream within that, and then a third layer. So I've gone gone down three layers. And the thing about it is fascinating. When you wake up, you, know, you think you're woke, you know, awake, but it's still a dream. And you say, "Oh my God, I had this other dream. It was so amazing, but now I'm awake. What a magical, great dream I had!" But then you're actually still inside the dream, and then you wake up, act, you know, here. Uh, in, in this world, right, um, where you realize, oh, it's all layers. So what's going on in the brain? I think it's a good, it's a good question. I don't think it's known what uh, is going on in terms of the circuitry, why you, you know, have that um, dream. With, but I've had, also, I've had dreams I only remembered in other dreams. So I would have, like, a dream, uh, and then I forget about it, seemingly, and then I wake up, then I have another dream, and I remember that other dream. Oh, I had a dream like two weeks, and I only remember that, you know, it's almost like those circuits are only activated in another dream. So that's another really weird phenomenon. But but let me tell you this. Um, the dream world is fascinating, and it's strange because, look, I've had a dream where I uh, woke myself up from laughter during a dream. So I had a joke. So I was sitting and chatting with this chap in my dream. So we were having a chat, you know, and this guy told me a joke. And I woke myself up from laughter. So I would, ha, 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 you know, it's so funny. And this is what I burst out in laughter. And I woke up and I said, well, what, what's happening? It was, it was just a dream. But when you think about it, a dream is only funny, or jokes are, excuse me, is only funny when you don't know the, 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 the punchline of the joke. That's what makes the joke funny, right? So you have a certain story plot, and then you have the punchline. But you have to not know the whole story plot, the, the, you know, the whole thing before it's funny. But the other guy in my dream presumably was myself telling me a joke and my brain was suppressing the information of the joke in order to make it funny to me and then wake me up. So it's strange how the brain works in, in layers like this. Um, and uh, yeah, so so absolutely the dream has, uh, the dream world and the brain has all these these interesting layers. And, and when you think about it, when you have a meaning con meaningful conversation with someone in your dream, I've had those. So I uh, have had dreams with sort of, really intense, meaningful conversations with people uh, in my dreams. But, you know, my brain was creating a theory of mind or constructing agency into that being and, and allowing that person to have a meaningful conversation with me. So I was, it was me having a meaningful conversation with myself in that way. So yes, it's quite, it's quite astonishing. Yeah, I remember only, I think, three of my dreams, like in my entire life. I, I know I've dreamt more than that, but it's very interesting to kind of see and analyze the themes of the dreams that I've had. Yeah. I've had one dream about visiting different universities. I have no idea why, probably because uni is such a big part of my life. Another yeah. dream about literally eating chocolate and being able to taste it. Like I could taste it. It felt so real. It, it was amazing, frankly. Oh, that's amazing. Yeah, when you taste something. What, what was it? So you've only remembered three dreams in your life? Is that what you heard? Yeah, 
I'm, I'm sure it's a bit of a recency bias because all of these were really in the past month or so. I forgot oh. about everything before. And oh, okay. it's just very interesting. It's, it seems kind of random. Um, but lastly, I had a dream that I was in London. <laughs> I have no idea. It's just, it's crazy. But soon thinking about it, I realized that, yeah, uni is a big part of my life. I love chocolate and I love London. So yeah, it yeah, kind of no, makes sense. Are you a heavy sleeper? I, su I suppose you're a very heavy sleeper. Is that right? Um, I'm actually not sure. I think in the middle of the night, of course, I think nothing can wake me up. But close to around um, the morning, I feel like I hear things. I hear people talking. I don't know if it's actually a dream or if it's real life. But I do hear people talking and that eventually wakes me up. Yeah, yeah. From my recollection, it turns out it's 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 people that are heavy sleepers that that don't that remember their dreams less, right? So they they usually say drink a big cup. Of, yeah, drink drink more water and a big cup of water before you go to bed. Then that can help you remember your dreams. Is is some you know, uh, you know people say that sometimes, but but um, yeah, it's interesting about not remembering your dreams and and sort of uh, yeah that 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 whole world, isn't it? It's 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 quite something. Uh, I was trying to say something, but I forgot. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it just slipped my uh, slipped my mind right now. But yeah, yeah, I always love to hear what people generally the themes of their dreams because it's really interesting to see how it correlates with their life, right? Like, yeah, super yeah. interesting. So, if any of our viewers have any interesting themes or things that just keep coming up, just let us know in the chat, and I'll respond to them after the live stream. Um, but yeah, let's end this on a very creative note. And for those who want to learn more about neuroscience or psychology or receive some expertise through Dr. Jalal's video, please check out our description box because I linked his YouTube channel and other social media links there. So please follow him if you like this content. And also let us know in the comment section what you want to see next, as I'm very excited to be able to host uh, more Ask an Expert live streams about topics that you want to learn about. So with that, thank you so much for watching. Thank you so much, Dr. Jalal, for joining. My pleasure. My pleasure. And yeah, we'll see you on the comment section. Bye. Bye-bye.